Am I recording? I hope I'm recording. Is this thing on? Hello everyone, it's me, C.B. Tomlinson, current English teacher and hopefully future novelist. We'll see how it goes. So today we'll be talking about redemption arcs, cause why not? These days, it seems like everyone and their grandmother are trying to write a redemption arc, and that's understandable. Redemption arcs are pretty popular, which raises the obvious question, why? Well, to put it simply, redemption arcs are what we want to believe in. We've all done something in our lives that we're not proud of, and we want to think that we're able to grow and move past that. Which is why the Redemption Arc is one of the oldest arcs in the world. Redemption Arcs have been around for as long as... Well, as long as stories have been around, really. One could argue that the Bible is just one big Redemption Arc for all of humanity. And as the old saying goes, if it's not broke, don't fix it. So while it's really no wonder why redemption arcs are so popular, the question remains, how do you write a good one? In recent years, we've seen some good redemption arcs, and we've seen some bad ones. So what separates the good redemptions from the bad redemptions? Well, I'm glad you asked, because that's what I'm here for. Kinda. I mean, I'm not here all the time for writing questions, because I do have a day job that I do to, you know, pay the bills and such. Why do I have lipstick on my thumb? In my studying of stories on my free time, because I'm a nerd, as well as my own experience in writing, which granted none of it has really been published, but you know, we're, we're all aspiring writers here trying to inspire each other. Aspiring inspire. Aspiring writers inspiring each other. Aspiring writers inspiring each other. Try saying that ten times fast. Today I'm going to share with you four criteria that I've noticed most, if not all, well-written redemption arcs have. So here we go. Also, uh, heads up, I'm going to be using examples from the following stories. So if you're worried about spoilers, Now's your chance to click away. So, yeah, if you don't want spoilers, this is where you, you, you go. Nice seeing you, though. Are all the spoiler police gone? Are the spoiler police gone now? Good. Okay. So, criteria one. Your character has to actually be redeemable. This should be obvious, but... <laughs> It's not. It's, it's apparently not. I mean, just look at the number of people who ship Harry and Voldemort, or Hermione and Voldemort, or Dipper and Bill Cipher. Ugh. Now, I'm not kink-shaming anyone, but... Actually, yeah, I am. That's nasty. Stop it. Harry and Hermione are minors, and Voldemort's an adult. And he's also evil and has tried to kill him on multiple occasions. And don't even get me started on Bill Dip. <clears throat> and also, Steven Universe is a thing. Yeah. They're homicidal dictators who have committed multiple genocide. Why are you trying to be nice to them? No, 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 no. Moving right along. There has to be something inside your character that shows us that they actually have a chance at turning a new leaf. That there is, to put it in Padme's words, still good in them. In the case of Zuko from Avatar The Last Airbender, we see as early as the first season that despite being on the bad guy's side, Zuko does actually have a sense of uh, no, I'm not gonna make any Zuko's honors jokes, because, let's face it, you'll be doing it in the comments anyway. So it's kind of redundant. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. We learn via flashback that the whole reason Zuko was exiled from the Fire Nation in the first place was because he was defending common foot soldiers, who the other generals wanted to basically use as cannon fodder. 
sacrificing their lives for the betterment of their quest. His whole reason for being estranged from his father is because he valued the lives of the common folk. That's not something you typically associate with a villain, and therefore tells us that despite his evil villainous ways, there is something in Zuko that is good that can possibly be saved. He has a chance at redemption. And this is strengthened by the fact that if you go back and re-watch the series, Zuko never actually killed anyone. I mean, he threatened people, but he didn't actually kill them, probably because the threats were all he really needed to do. I mean, if you were walking down the street and a guy who can create and manipulate fire with a snap of his fingers told you to go do something, I'd be like, okay, chief, yeah, we're cool, we're cool, we're cool. Just, just put the fire away, put the fire away. I'm not trying to get barbecued today. Just, just, we're good, we're good. Yeah, yeah, yep, 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 oh, you want me to go back that way? Okay, okay, yeah, I'm gone, bye, bye. Yeah, he's still on the wrong side of the war, but he, at the very least, tried to save people's lives. That deserves at least a little bit of hope. Just that alone makes us as the audience want to give him a second chance. Compare this to the diamonds from Steven Universe who have slaughtered thousands, if not mill, have committed multiple genocides, only two of which we have confirmed, but probably more. They literally destroy planets and they oppress their people by keeping them in a rigid caste system, which dictates that they abide by the rules or be killed. And thus far in the story, they have shown no remorse for any of this. No, no, no remorse at all, at all. And before you start blasting me in the comments, no, Blue Diamond crying about how they made Pink sad by all their terrible actions was not remorse for her actual actions. That was remorse that she hurt her sister's feelings, which Granted, hurting someone's feelings is not good either. But Blue Diamond was not actually sorry that she destroyed planets and white species off the face of the universe and murdered thousands. She was upset because she made her sister Diamond cry. Really, girl? Really? 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 Yeah, just give us a reason to want to root for your villain or antagonist or whoever it is you're redeeming in your story. Which honestly doesn't take a lot. All you have to do is have your character that you're redeeming do something of value. It could be trying to stick up for the little guy like Zuko did. It could be giving money to beggars on the street. It could be wanting to build an orphanage for all the poor orphans who are on the street. It could be refusing to kill. Anything that gives us, the audience, a slight hint that there might be something good in them. But let's say you are in a situation where you can't really show us that the villain or the antagonist or whoever you're trying to redeem does have some good in them. Maybe your villain just isn't on screen or page for the majority of the story. Or maybe you're just tired and you don't want to go revise your work again to insert a scene of your villain doing some good deed. And if that's the case, I'm not judging. Look, we all gotta have a day job to support our writing gig until the writing gig takes off and can pay the bills. And that's exhausting. That's exhausting. I am not downing you for not wanting to go back and add in another scene. I, I get it. Trust me, I get it. But still, you're probably wondering, CV, is there like a like a shortcut I can take so I don't have to 
quite a whole new scene? Well, yes, actually there is. Let's take a look at Darth Vader. Star Wars fans, put the pitchforks down. Put them down. Just, just put them down for a minute. Hear me out first. Just wait till you get to the end of this video first. Okay? Okay? If you still don't like me by the end of this video, then you can throw your tomatoes at me. But you're gonna hear me out first. Even though Darth Vader is the main villain of the original Star Wars trilogy and does some pretty terrible things, Luke insists that there's still good in him, that he can still be redeemed. Problem is, we don't actually see that good till the very end after Darth Vader's already redeemed himself. Essentially, we're told that there's good in Darth Vader, but we're not actually shown. CV, are you telling me that the genius George Lucas broke one of the cardinal rules of writing? Yo, don't tell. Well, yes and no. Actually, yes, but it kind of works for Star Wars. If you go back and watch the original trilogy and actually pay attention to how long each character's on the screen, Darth Vader's actually not in the vast majority of the original trilogy. Let me break it down for you. In the 121 minute runtime of A New Hope, Darth Vader is only on screen for 9 minutes and 15 seconds. For the 124 minute runtime of Empire Strikes Back, he's only present on screen for 13 minutes and 15 seconds. And for the 131 minute run screen time of Return of the Jedi, Darth Vader is only present for 14 minutes and 45 seconds. When you do the math, that's about 10% of the original trilogy that Darth Vader is actually well, there. So even though Luke is telling us that Darth Vader can be redeemed, we don't know enough about Vader to either confirm or deny this. We haven't seen the man for 90% of these films. Is Luke correct in saying that his father can be redeemed? Is he wrong? Is this the dark side messing with his head so the Emperor and Darth Vader can eventually manipulate him into joining the Empire? These questions that the audience inevitably asks themselves when Luke tells Leia that there is still good in him adds another layer of tension to the story. Is Luke actually going to be able to save his father or is he walking right into a trap? We don't know and we're sitting on the edge of our seats waiting to find out what's going to happen. So to sum up, yes, there are shortcuts you can take. Just make sure you think your shortcuts out, if that makes sense. Yes, the tell don't show for Darth Vader worked out because he wasn't in the majority of the films, but that's a very specific case scenario. If the character you're trying to redeem is present for more than 10% of your story, then this trick probably won't work. But hey, go ahead, put this trick in your back pocket. It might not work out for the story you're currently working on, but eh, you never know what projects you might pick up later in life. So, yeah, who knows? Maybe you can pull a Darth Vader. When I say maybe you can pull a Darth Vader, I mean the whole taking a shortcut with the redemption arc thing. Don't, don't, don't actually become a Sith Lord. Okay, that, that, that probably won't end well for the rest of us. Criteria number two, there has to be a reason for your character to want to change. As humans, we seek to be comfortable. We like familiarity. We like routine. We like keeping the status quo because it's comfortable for us. By that same token, we don't like change because change is unknown and change takes work and change is, well, uncomfortable. Isaac Newton's first law is that an object at rest will remain at rest until it is acted upon by an outside force. This is essentially the same for your characters. Characters won't change just because. They need a reason to change. There has to be something compelling them to want to be a different person. In the case of Zuko, this is actually seeing what the Fire Nation's conquest is doing to the rest of the world. 
seeing how small the Southern Water Tribe has become, seeing how desiccated and poor the Earth Kingdom is, seeing how desperate people now are because of this hundred year war, seeing people, innocent civilians who have been injured by Fire Nation soldiers. Before, Zuko couldn't see any of these consequences to the war his father was fighting. He spent most of his life secluded in the royal palace. He didn't know what was going on in the rest of the world, and when he saw it, it kind of made him have a wait a second, this not good moment. Uh, granted, this moment lasted a pretty long time. It took Zuko a long time from realizing that what he was doing and what his father was doing was wrong and actually making a change, which is not a bad thing. More on that later. In the case of Darth Vader, the Emperor was about to kill his son. And it was at this moment that Darth Vader kind of had a hello, I'm a bad guy moment and decided to kill the Emperor instead. Now, one could argue this was either Darth Vader actually redeeming himself or just wanting to save his son. You don't necessarily have to redeem yourself from villainy to care about your own child. Most people care about their offspring. So, bit of a gray area there, but I'm still gonna say it's redemption. And I'm gonna explain more in the last criteria. Now I'm gonna go back to the Diamonds from Steven Universe, but this time I'm not going to talk badly about them. For a little while. See, the scene in the containment chamber when Blue Diamond realizes she's been hurting Pink Diamond could have been her aha moment that she needed to change. It could have been the catalyst that would make her start questioning the things she was doing. Why was Pink so torn up by all the things that Blue, Yellow, and White were doing? Why was it such a big deal to Pink? What was Pink seeing that the other three were not? These are all questions that Blue Diamond could have started asking herself and in seeking answers to those questions could have begun her redemption arc. However, Sugar didn't do that. She cut out the whole journey part of the redemption arc and just had her poof, redeemed. Speaking of which, criteria number three, redemption is a journey. This is something I've been seeing a lot in recent media, and it's becoming a pet peeve of mine. I've seen some people on some writing forums calling this a snapshot redemption, and that's kind of fitting. A snapshot redemption is essentially when a character redeems themselves just like only that's not how redemption works, or people work, or well-written characters work. Like I said when talking about Criteria 2, change is uncomfortable. We don't like it. And so having to power through it takes a lot of effort and a lot of time. It takes time to change yourself for the better. It takes time and energy to turn a new leaf. And that journey usually isn't a pretty one. If you take a really close look at Zuko's redemption journey, you might actually notice that Zuko goes through the five stages of grief while going through his redemption arc. And that makes total sense. In order for you to redeem yourself, you have to admit to yourself that you were wrong, that you were the bad guy, that the things you were doing were at best bad and at worst completely and utterly evil. This is not something anyone wants to admit to themselves. This is not something anyone wants to live with. And this could, and I'd argue even should, cause grief in your character. Don't believe me? Let's take a closer look at the five stages of grief and how they relate to Zuko. Stage one, denial. This is basically the entire first season. See, a lot of people say that Zuko didn't start noticing the damage that the Fire Nation was inflicting on the other 
nations of the world until season two, but I'd argue this isn't true. Zuko saw how small the Southern Water Tribe had become. He saw how upset Katara and Sokka were. He saw the pirates that had sprung up because of the poverty in all the other lands. He was seeing the damage that his father caused, but he wasn't acknowledging any of it because, well, he was in denial. His obsession with finding the Avatar could be interpreted as just a desperate desire to want to get home, but I'd argue that it's a little more than that. It's Zuko basically putting blinders on himself to keep himself in this state of denial he was in. He didn't want to admit that what he was doing was wrong because nobody wants to admit what they're doing is wrong. Nobody wants to be the bad guy. Stage two, anger. This stage you can see in season two when Zuko is stuck in the Earth Kingdom with nowhere to go. Here, he can no longer keep up his denial. He is confronted with the damage that his father and he himself have done to these poor, innocent people. And it makes him angry. We see him lash out at everyone. The fire guards in the village he got stuck in at Zuko alone. The gang. The weather. His uncle Iroh, who has been with him through thick and thin, the boy is taking his anger out on everything and anything around him. He is now being confronted with the fact that this whole time he's been the villain, but he doesn't want to admit to this. However, because of the situation he's now in in season two, where he can no longer hide behind his guards or his fancy ships or even his name as the Fire Prince because he's having to go into disguise to keep himself alive, denial is becoming harder and harder. And his response to that is anger, as it naturally would be. Again, he's going through the five stages of grief. Stage three, bargaining. This happens at the end of season two. We see Zuko almost, almost turn that new leaf when he's in the cave with Katara. But then Azula comes in and reminds him why he went after the Avatar in the first place. To come home. To earn his father's approval so he would no longer be exiled. At this point, Zuko knows he's changed. He knows he's not the same person he was when he was first exiled, but he doesn't want to admit that his reasons for changing were because he realized what the Fire Nation was doing was evil. He's trying to bargain with himself, tell himself that he's just grown up or become more wise or learn some valuable lesson that's now going to make him a better prince and a better son make him worthy of his father's love and acceptance. Subconsciously, he's aware that this is wrong, but he still hasn't been able to come to terms with that. Moving on to stage four, depression. This is the first half of season three, where we see Zuko well depressed. He's not interested in any of the activities he used to be. He's not lively, he's not talking, he's just kind of there. He still has some angry outbursts, but they're not as ferocious as they were before. They don't come from a place of anger, they come from a place of sadness, depression. Even though Zuko hasn't owned up to it verbally, internally he knows he's on the wrong side of the war, and he's upset by it, but he either doesn't know what he needs to do about it, or does know and just doesn't want to take that step. Eventually though, he has to be honest with himself, and this leads into the final stage, acceptance. This happens when Zuko finally confronts his father, tells him everything he learned on his journey, that he knows that the Fire Nation's conquest is wrong, and that he's going to help the Avatar. Phew! That was exhausting. But if you want a well-crafted redemption arc in your story, then that journey of redemption needs to be exhausting. 
It needs to be difficult. It needs to be heart and gut-wrenching and painful. And you can have relapses. Zuko had a relapse in the cave after he and Katara had their tender moment and then here comes Azula ruining everything, as she does. This might sound tedious, and figuring out all the fine details of how your redemption journey is going to work may very well be, but in the end, it'll all be worth it. The longer and more complicated your redemption journey is, the more exciting and exhilarating it's gonna be when your character finally reaches that acceptance stage and finally turns that new leaf. We've been rooting for this person for so long to just do better, and now they're finally doing it. Which leads us to the fourth criteria of a good redemption arc. Number four, consequences. This is the one that seems to get skimmed over the most. Yes, your character has gone through this journey of self-discovery. They, if the story was done right, have gone through the five stages of grief. They have now turned a new leaf and they're beginning a new journey. But that doesn't mean that their old life or their old selves are now moot. They still did terrible things as a villain and they have to pay the consequences for that. In the case of Darth Vader, it's death. Darth Vader finally redeems himself by saving his son and killing the Emperor, but in the process he's gravely injured and dies. This is his consequence for all the terrible things he's done. Even though he's redeemed himself, he doesn't get to go on and have a happy life. And this consequence extends past his death. As we see in the sequel trilogy, Darth Vader is still remembered as this horrible, evil being. His memory eventually corrupts his grandson. His legacy is not one of a hero, but one of a villain. Even though he's the one who brought balance to the Force and saved the galaxy, no one remembers him for that. They remember him as Darth Vader, this person who murdered and stole and destroyed everything around him. This is his consequence. He can't get out of it. This is the price he pays for his villainy. Now, not all consequences have to be quite that extreme. In the case of Zuko, his consequence is that Team Avatar doesn't trust him. He has to work really hard to be a part of the gang. He has to work really hard to get Aang, Katara, Sokka, and Toph to trust him. He doesn't just get to come in and say, Hey guys, I'm a good guy now, and they're like, Oh, cool, come on. No, he has to prove himself over and over and over again. And even after he becomes Fire Lord, his consequence doesn't quite end. Similar to Darth Vader, the Fire Nation's legacy as the ones who almost destroyed the world carries over into the Legend of Korra. Even though this perception is not linked to Zuko personally, since he was one of the ones who freed the world from Lord Ozai, there's still this stigma around the Fire Nation for what they did. So much so that Zuko's daughter is afraid to fight against Kuvira in fear of putting her people in an uncomfortable position where they're viewed as the villains yet again. It's been 60 years since that war ended, but Zuko and all the Fire Nation people are still dealing with that stigma. Again, this is their consequence. Just because they're the good guys now, they don't get a free pass on all the horrible things they did in their past. They still have to own up to it. They still have to pay their dues. Once again, this is where the diamonds fall flat. The diamonds are Darth Vader times a thousand. Darth Vader may have destroyed everything around him when he came to one galaxy, but the diamonds have done that for multiple galaxies. They have murdered multiple creatures, aliens. Would we consider them people? The gems aren't considered people, so are other aliens considered people in Steven Universe, or are they just sentient beings? Tell me in the comments what you think. 
So even though the diamond supposedly turned a new leaf, again, I'm not that convinced because the only thing they showed remorse for was hurting pink diamond. Again, hurting pink diamond was bad, but being mean to your little sister, murdering thousands of millions of poor innocent space creatures. One of these things is not like the other. Regardless of whether or not you believe the diamonds were actually redeemed, or if they just wanted to play nice with their very powerful younger sister slash nephew. And people wonder why Steven needs therapy. Oy, oy, oy. The diamonds pay no consequences for anything they've done. They just get to say, hey, we're nice now, and everyone's like, okay, cool. No. No, that's not how it works. So, blue, yellow, white, you're good guys now. Great. But you still committed multiple genocide. And despite what Steven may think or believe, you still gotta pay up for that. You don't just get a free pass on multiple genocides. You've gotta pay the price. And I'm not usually a person who calls for death on anyone, even fictional characters, but in this case scenario, yeah, kinda. If for no other reason than this, the people that your character hurt need to have their justice. You can't deny another character their justice just because this character changed their ways. There still has to be a follow through there. And that's just how it works. Not just in the literary world, but in the real world. In a 2009 article written by, let's see, Judy Eaton and Anna Thuer, 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 ah, sorry, Anna, if I butchered your last name, it was found that one third of inmates on death row showed genuine remorse for the terrible things they did and offered a direct apology to the victim or the victim's family. But that didn't save them from death row. Just because they were sorry for whatever it is they did, they still had to pay the consequence for their actions. That's just a truth in life and in fiction. Well, that's kind of a grim note to end this video on. But anyways, there you go. Four criteria you need to meet in order to have a good redemption story. Why am I holding up two hands? This is eight. So I hope that was at least a little bit helpful for you, maybe. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the like button, leave a comment. And if you could follow all my other social media down in the description box, I'd greatly appreciate it. Let me know if there's anything else you want me to talk about story-wise, character arcs, tropes, archetypes, just whatever. Just link it down below. Link it? No. Comment down below and I'll get to it when I can. So, yeah. See you later, my fellow aspiring writers. Okay, let's try this again. That's okay. This is what editing is for. So, first question. Yeah. When in an Agni Kai with Jin Wu Zhao, he fights according to the rules. Despite the fact that Commander Zhao cheated. Even Iroh comments on the fact that. Uh, even Iroh comments on. Eh, it's allergy season. Stay safe out there, children. Even Iroh comments on the fact that. Uh, ugh, even Iroh comments on. Needless to say, redemption. I've already said that. I'm repeating myself. Why am I repeating myself? What are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? Where I'm going with this? I had a thought, and I lost it. We see in flashbacks that the whole reason Zuko was expelled. Expelled. <laughs>
Can you tell I'm a teacher by day? Expelled. <laughs> Some people on certain formas have. Formas? 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 What's my forma? What am I trying to say here? What am I trying to say? One of these things is not like the other. One of these things is not like the other. There we go. Four criteria. <laughs> and then I 